All right, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, whenever it is you're actually watching this, uh, this lecture. Um, my name is Greg Freisinger, so I'm going to give you a guest lecture today for your PL394 class. And I think I'm going to talk mostly about sort of deadlift dynamics, but also just giving you some background on dynamics. So I'm an assistant professor of civil and mechanical engineering. Um, I teach dynamics and vibrations engineering and also our biomechanics class, which is introduction to biomechanical engineering. Uh, XE310. So I want to just give you a little bit of a sense of how I think about biomechanics problems, right? Once I know you've done some stuff with Major Feltner on static systems, but once things start moving, right, how do we apply some of those physics laws to, to the system of a human body to try and make some predictions and also estimate forces and accelerations velocity, right? So I want to talk through a few of those things today. Um, yeah, thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, hopefully Major Feltner will be able to like put up a team site or I can answer questions over email or we can sort of go back and forth that way since it's not obviously ideal doing it. Uh, you know, I was hoping to do this in person in class, but that's not really how the semester is going. So, uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Let's get started. All right, so a few of the lesson objectives first just to start. Um, I want to summarize basic dynamics terminology, mainly looking at things like force and impulse, uh, acceleration, velocity, and position, thinking about power, momentum. These are terms you've likely heard before in your physics classes or in high school or maybe in you know, PL394. Um, so I want to sort of at least summarize some of those so we're all starting at the same page, we all have the same terminology, and then review some Newton's second law and how do we sort of calculate power? And then lastly, investigate some experimental data that I took on myself doing some deadlifts over uh, winter break to help sort of motivate the lesson and give you a sense of what's, what's real out there. All right, so before we get started on the, the sort of dynamics piece, what I wanna do is just give you a little bit of background since you don't really know anything about me. Um, so I grew up in Maywood, New Jersey, which is not too far from here. It's about an hour south. For my undergrad, I went to Georgia Tech. So I was there from 2002 to 2006, where I studied mechanical engineering. I was also in Army ROTC. I was an active duty engineer officer from 2006 to 2010, where I was a platoon leader for the 643rd Engineer Company. I was the forward support company XO and the battalion S4. All of that was in the 84th Engineer Bata Battalion, which is a construction effects battalion in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. While I was in the 84th, we deployed to Thailand for a humanitarian mission where we were um, developing and building some schools. So that's the upper right-hand picture there. That's me and a fellow platoon leader when we were in Thailand. It was really great, cool mission to sort of, I don't know, do something good for a community and feel some appreciation for doing some real construction stuff that actually matters. And then also spent a year in Iraq in 2009 where I was mostly stationed out of Mosul Again, doing mostly fob construction, construction effects, helping out the logistics for our battalion in 2009. That bottom right-hand picture is me and my wife, Susan. She's also an engineer officer. This was her promotion to cap to captain. She uh, was the, the aide for the Pacific Ocean Division General. That's her mentor there, Mark Yenter, and his wife, Lisa, who are uh, great friends of ours now. And just a fun, a fun time being in Hawaii. So after we got out of the Army in 2010, I went back to grad school at Ohio State, where I focused on biomechanical engineering. Um, my degrees are actually in mechanical engineering, but you can kind of, you know, my, my dissertation where most of my research happened was in biomechanics, right? Specifically, what I studied was looking at knee laxity in people with severe osteoarthritis and total knee replacement. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I'm going to go to the laser pointer here. Let's get a little practice before... Oh man, pointer options, okay, laser pointer. Right, so I was, just to break down word by word this sort of dissertation, right? So what we were doing is we were studying people with severe osteoarthritis and total knee replacement. So you might have heard those terms before, but the general idea is osteoarthritis is when your cartilage degrades and it degrades to such an extent that your bones start rubbing on bones. So if you think about your femur, right, your thigh and your tibia and your shank, you have a lot of weight going through that joint. 
And what the cartilage does is a really slippery surface, right? So you have no fric no, almost no friction when you're sort of moving those bones relative to each other. But your cartilage also doesn't have any nerves, right? So you don't feel the pressure or the force going through your cartilage. Now, when your cartilage degrades to such an extent that it's bone rubbing on bone, it's really, really painful. So the, the sort of end stage treatment, because cartilage is also pretty hard to fix. So what happens if somebody does have degraded cartilage, they get older, they have injuries or whatever. Uh, the Surgeons will do sort of a, a, a end stage procedure called a total knee replacement, right? Or TKA or total knee arthro or arthroplasty. Um, and what they're doing is they're cutting off the ends of your bones where that cartilage is, because cartilage isn't very thick, so they cut off the ends of the bones where the cartilage is, and they replace the end of your femur with a metal component. They replace the end of your tibia with a metal component, and they put a, a polymer spacer in between there. So what that does is basically, now you don't have bone rubbing on bone. Hopefully it's less painful. You still have a, you have a smaller degree of friction between the knee. And this is sort of the end stage, right? But there's there's lots of things we don't know about this procedure, some of which is, you know, how important surgical technique is. So one aspect of surgical technique is how stiff or loose the knee joint is. So that's the idea of knee laxity, right? So how stiff or loose is the knee joint? So for my dissertation, what we did, and again, it's not like I came up with this idea, right? Sometimes people think getting a PhD, you have to like have some genius idea. No, you just need to show up at grad school and your advisors and people who've been working on this for a long time are getting grants and doing all sorts of interesting work, right? So really it was my advisor and his colleagues who came up with the idea of, well, how do we measure laxity in the operating room? Can I measure what a surgeon's doing in the operating room? And then what we can do is track people after surgery. So if we test them beforehand, we measure things in the operating room, and then we bring them back six months and two years after surgery, right? And we bring them into our motion capture lab where we're looking at how they move, what do the forces look like in their knee, how do their muscles work, what sort of pain do they have, how fast does it take them to go up and down stairs, what's their strength, how do, how do those change from before to six months to two years after surgery, and are any of those things related to each other or related to what the surgeon is doing in the operating room. All right, so this is sort of my first experience with biomechanics. I didn't do anything as an undergrad. I just thought when I was coming back to school that it was really cool um, and had a great experience at Ohio State with my advisor, Ajit Chowdhury. Um, and then was lucky enough to get a job here, right? So I've been an assistant professor at uh, West Point for about five years now. And I ended up coming here to, to one, study exosuits. Um, so we did a pretty long training study researching the training effect of powered exosuits with Harvard and the Army Research Lab. I've also done some work with rigid exoskeletons with the VA down in New York City, some injury prediction and prevention work. Um, and again, these are some of the other things I'm interested in like dogs and strength training and woodworking. I'm a big fan of sleep, uh, trap music, binge watching television, especially right now. And then Nike sneakers and shoes. I have about 20 pairs in my office that are just Air Maxes and all sorts of random things that the cadets seem to happen to know me by. So this, this is my older slide. I made a new one this year too. Give you a little more recent updates. This is my fifth year in CME. Uh, I've been reappointed back into the Army as a captain with uh, 75th Innovation Command. So that's a new unit that got started up to support Army Futures Command. So with that, some of it, some of my work there is setting up West Point's Hacking for Defense, doing some exo suit research with MIT Lincoln Lab, and collaborating with other Army institutes from a, a sort of reservist perspective, right? So this is me getting recommissioned or reappointed back in front of Mahan Hall, which was fun because this was Jack Montgomery. He was one of my students. He was able to recommission me uh, and then be my first second second first salute. Um, here's our my dog, Delta Burke. Uh, I do some research with running and postural control now with Keller Army Community Hospital and the physical therapist there. This is a friend of mine, actually, Dr. Scott Montford, who does a lot of postural control research out in Montana. So we were lucky enough to go to a conference in Dublin last year. Uh, and then this was my wife and his wife and a friend of ours from Germany who all sort of met up and took a trip to Scotland. So this is at the Lagavulin Distillery in Scotland. So if you need any more incentive to do research, give it a try. The army might send you to some interesting places to present it. Uh, then you can hang out with your friends and drink scotch. Um, 
Lastly, so my wife and I were foster parents. It sort of ended in 2019, but we're still pretty involved. So this is Kylie and Connor. Don't worry, Connor figured his way out sooner or later. It just took him a little bit of a struggle once he got himself in there. Um, so yeah, that's me a little bit more recently. So now at least you know a little bit about me, so it's not as weird just listening to me blab on about deadlift dynamics or I don't know, maybe it's more weird. You tell me. All right, so now what I want to do is I'm going to transition it to the iPad. Uh, it's a little bit easier to sort of just write down things with my stylists. You know, I trying to draw like force equals MA. I could show you how bad it would look if I got the pen out right now. Like force equals mass times acceleration, right? That is god awful. But my handwriting isn't that much better, but it's just a lot easier to sort of walk through it on the iPad. So I'm going to have another video talking about some things on the iPad, doing screen record. And then once you finish that one, we'll come back and we'll do some of the experimental stuff here. All right, so you can turn this off now and open up the other video for the iPad. All right, so welcome back. If you haven't yet watched the iPad video of me going through some basic dynamics notes, please do. We're gonna use some of those terminologies here. So uh, that's why there was the pause, but should be coming back to the, the video for the PowerPoint now. So to sort of demonstrate a few of those concepts, what I want to do is a little bit of experiment. So over winter break, what I did is I did some deadlifts in Mahan Hall, and I did it with 45 pounds, 135 pounds, 225 pounds, and then 315 pounds. So I tried to lift all of them. So I did a single deadlift at each of those weights, and I tried to lift it as fast as I possibly could, right? So I tried to use as much muscle activation as possible even if it was 45 pounds, right? Trying to rip that thing off the floor, 315 was not as quick, to be honest, uh, as you're gonna see, right? So I, I tried to, to just lift with as much possible muscle activity to see what the sort of, um, what the results would look like. I wore an accelerometer on my wrist, so we're gonna see a video here in a second, but I had an accelerometer on my wrist, and that accelerometer measures acceleration in three directions, right? Um, so you can think about if we're moving in three directions, it can measure in three directions. For the deadlift, just like in the other video, we're only gonna consider the up motion, but it's important to note that the accelerometer wasn't fixed to the bar, it wasn't oriented perfectly vertically, so we might see some acceleration in other directions too, right? It's collecting it in all directions. And then what I did is I wrote some MATLAB code to sort of process that data, analyze it, and we're gonna sort of apply Newton's second law to some of that acceleration data and also look at some of the other kinematics like velocity and probably not position, but I want to again get back to sort of the idea of force, acceleration, and power. All right, so we're going to do that with some of this experimental, experimental data. All right, so here's the video. So I think this is 225. Um, I'm not going to show you all three of them, but the general idea is this wireless accelerometer, which is on my hand, let me get the pointer back out. So here's the accelerometer, it looks like a little bracelet, right? I go over to my phone, it collects it wirelessly, I hit record on my phone, then I walk over to the bar, right? I'm gonna lift it, walk back over to the phone and hit stop, and the phone with this app actually records video at the same time, so they're, they're kind of synchronized to the data. All right, so let's see, how do I get back to my regular pointer. Oh, goodness. All right, no more laser pointer, now I can click. All right, so again, I walk over, get set up. And again, as quickly as I can, try and pull that thing off the ground. So I don't know if this is really a good time to talk about, and then I have to pick up my phone, right, and mess with it because I'm trying to hit the off button. But I don't know if this is a great time to talk about sort of technique, deadlift technique. Um, I'm sure you talk about that a lot with your DPE folks, but sure, let's show it anyway. Let's get this pointer back up, right? So when you're trying to deadlift, um, some of the things you wanna do are contract your lats, keep it tight, and keep your lumbar spine relatively flat. You don't wanna be rounding over like this because it places a lot of stress in and a lot of loads through your spine when it's in the flex position. And your spine actually isn't that strong when it's flex, right? It might be easier for you to lift the weight because you're sort of reducing the moment arm, but over time, right, you wanna strengthen up those spinal, that spinal musculature 
so you can keep the spine in a neutral position. Okay. And to be fair, I'm not a really great, not a good deadlifter. I'm not a very strong person. Uh, I have spent a decent amount of time in a powerlifting gym when I was in grad school with a, a world-class powerlifter whose name was Matt Wenning. And I coached the women's powerlifting team here and helped out with the powerlifting team a little bit. Again, not strong, but from a biomechanic standpoint, when you're doing your ACFT, a few things you might want to think about is not just letting your back round completely because it does kind of put your spine in a compromised position. All right, so let's try and make a few predictions. So which weight, 45, 135, 225, or 315 pounds, do you think will have the following? So in your mind, or I don't know, on a piece of paper, why don't you write down which one do you think will have the largest peak acceleration? 45, 135, 225, 315. All right, what about the largest peak force? And lastly, what about the largest peak power? So do you think all of these will be the same? You think they'll all be 45 pounds or all be 315 or you think it's gonna change? Um, right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some of that experimental data and we're gonna start to dig into each of these individual ones. And we'll start with peak acceleration. All right, so through the data, through the, the data collected on the phone, this is what you get. So I imported the acceleration data in three uh, in three channels, right? So that's our X, Y, and our Z. And again, this is related to the orientation of the sensor on my wrist, not the orientation of the room, okay? And you can see, here's when I hit start, right? And then if we look at the Z acceleration, so there's this, okay, it stays at about, what does that look like, about 10? meters per second squared here, right? Then we have this huge spike, right? Goes back to being pretty stable and not really moving. You see something going, something seems like it's going on here. Again, pretty, pretty stable. Something's happening again here. And then it sort of shifts a little bit. And that's the end, right? So that's the end of our of our data collection. So based on that video, what do you think is happening here? So what's happening here? So I don't know if you remember, if you were paying attention, but one thing I did, I walked up to the bar and then I sort of shook my hands, right? I took both my hands and shook them, right? Um, and I did that on purpose, right? I did that so I could sort of get a crazy big signal to sort of tell me when I was pretty close to the bar, right? Um, I don't wanna go back to the video now because I think it'll get messed up with the other recording that I did, but go back to the other one, watch me do the deadlift again. So I go up there, I shake my hands, then I sort of wait, I get set up, I grab the bar, then I pull, right? And then I stop at the top. So I think this is when I'm getting set by the bar, this is when I'm stopped at the top, and this is when I drop the bar to the ground and walk back over to my phone. So this is a problem with real, uh, with real data. Sorry about that, my FaceTime was going off for some reason. Um, so this is the problem with real data. Sometimes it's noisy, right? You have to try and look at this data and see what's important. And also which direction is up, right? Is it X, is it Y, is it Z? We're gonna zoom in on this little area here. I think hopefully that will tell you or help us better see which way was actually, or which, is, which one of these channels, X, Y, or Z, was predominantly in the up direction. All right, so from the last slide, right, we talked about, I think this is definitely when I shook my hands, right? I got set up, grabbed the bar. This is me waiting at the top, and I think this is me when I dropped the bar back down. Right? We can also look at the time, how much time it took for each of those, right? So this is in seconds down here. Um, it's actually in uh, microseconds, right? So we're getting a lot of data points for every second, a lot of data points. I think this was collected at was it 400 hertz or maybe 800 hertz, which is 800 samples a second? Um, so there's, there's a lot of data points here, but I think this is the area when I'm actually lifting the bar off the ground. And if I look at the X, right? So X doesn't really change very much. It's hard to see because it's back there, but it doesn't really change too much. So maybe that's left and right. I'm not really, my wrist is not really accelerating much left and right. And then maybe we think forward and backward, right? 
I think maybe the yellow, the Z, might be closer to forward and backward. Um, just based on how much change there is from no motion. But then if I look at here, it's in red, the Y, there's this sort of sinusoidal shaped curve. And that's kind of what I would expect. So what I did is I zoomed in on that and blew it up. See, so you have this sort of sinusoidal shaped curve. So what's happening when you're doing a deadlift, right? You're starting stopped. The first thing you have to do is you need to start moving the bar up, right? Velocity has to start moving upward. So there you're gonna have some amount of acceleration. And here, based on the sensor orientation, it's actually negative, right? So it doesn't really matter if it's negative or positive, it's just how the sensor is oriented. But you're starting at rest. It needs to get some velocity, right? So you're giving it some velocity, you're changing that velocity. But then at some point, right, it needs to slow back down because eventually this barbell is gonna stop. So it has to accelerate to a certain point and then it has to decelerate to a certain point, right? And then it comes back to rest, so that's over here. So when people talk about acceleration, especially with a lot of lifting people, right? They say, well, you wanna reduce, or you wanna reduce the amount someone has to decelerate the weight, right? So you wanna accelerate the weight as much as possible. But in reality, if the weight is starting and stopping at zero velocity, there has to be an equal amount of sort of acceleration and deceleration Otherwise, this weight would just keep moving, right? Um, so I think you can kind of see that here. So now the, the raw data is in blue. You see how it's kind of noisy and spiky. Um, and then in red behind it, what I did is just basically tried to filter out some of that noise to make it a little bit more clean. Um, this right here was something I wasn't really expecting, right? I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. Why would there be such a big acceleration then it slows down so much, then it starts back up. And the only thing I can think of is because the accelerometer is attached to my wrist, is that when I start to pull here, right, this quick acceleration is just my wrist moving upward. And then it has to like slow back down because it sort of like, you know, like hits the weight. Like if you can hear the weight sort of clang a little bit um, as my hand is like gripping onto the bar now more tightly. Like it's possible my hand wasn't super tight on the bar. So there's some movement of just my hand, but not the bar. And then it's like, all right, well now it's actually got to get back in line with what the bar is doing. So I think that's what this little, this little characteristic spike is. This motion right here might just be my wrist moving without the bar. But based on the experiment I did, you can't really tell, right? There's no way to kind of tell which is the bar and which is my hand. So we'd have to do a different experiment to sort of test that maybe put an accelerometer on the bar itself and then another one on my hand and, and line them up to see how they change, right? But again, this is some of the some of the challenges with working with real data. After the fact, you start looking at it, you gotta start to try and make sense of it. So I think, I think that's what's happening here is there's a little bit of artifact from just my hand moving, but not the actual weight on the bar moving. And we'll see if we, that shows up in the other ones. Um, but yeah, so now we can start to look at, well, what's the peak acceleration Right now it would be negative. This is this would be the peak deceleration. How much it was able to slow that bar down. And then here is where it sort of rests at the top. All right. So if we want to know which one has the highest acceleration, we can compare all three. Or oh, sorry, all four. So this is our 45 pound deadlift, which we just did before. Right, acceleration on the y, time on the x. This is 135 pounds, this is 225 pounds, and this is 315 pounds. So I apologize in advance. If you notice, 315 pound figure looks a lot sort of different and crummier, right? Because you can't really read this, it's hard to see. The acceleration values, hopefully you're not squinting looking at your computer, I'll try and read them out for you. But I think the reason for that is that the time scale, right? So this whole deadlift for 45 pounds took me about 0.1, two, five seconds, maybe 0.15 seconds for 135 pounds, right? We, again, we have that negative acceleration here where I'm starting to lift the bar up. Again, I think this is my hand just moving, but then we're moving the bar up. I have to decelerate the bar down and then we get back to the bar standing still. This one took a little bit, a little longer, maybe 0.16 seconds for 225 pounds. Again, we have this big spike back and forth. I think now you're really starting to see 
my hand just moving and then my hand has to slow down because now the weight's getting kind of heavy. So it's not like the 45 where was, my grip didn't play a, as big of a role. Okay. Right. So again, this one, just in terms of time, we still have the characteristic shape, right? Right there maybe is where it stops again, 0.17 seconds. And now if we look at 315, right now you see, this is, I think, definitely where it, I realized what was happening. I have this huge spike negative and a huge spike positive and that's my hand just getting ready to grip that bar. And then it's just really low amounts of acceleration. So the noise is really big here. You can see the noise much more because again, on the Y axis, now we're only going from eight to negative eight, where here it was 15 to negative 20, right? So the scale is twice as much. So the, the noise looks bigger. And the amount of acceleration, if we sort of took the average here, would be not very much, right? It was not moving 315 that quickly. And then when I slowed it down here, and then it comes back to rest, right? So if we start to look at, well, which one had the max? Well, let's look at these peaks down here, right? If we assume that this first peak, let's call that just my hand noise. The second peak was negative 15 meters per second. For 45, again, the second peak was about negative seven for 135. The second peak was about negative four meters per second. And then for this one, the second peaks were like, I don't know, negative two. So maybe as you would expect, as the weight got higher, right, my peak acceleration went down. Like I was not able to move 135 pounds as fast as 45, or 225 as fast as 135, or 315 as fast as 225, right? And it also kind of looks the same for the deceleration, right? I was able to slow the 45 pounder down at 10 meters per second. Actually 135, I actually slowed that one down about the same slowed down 225, maybe about seven, and then slowed down 315, maybe about four meters per second squared. So all those things kind of make sense when we're looking through the data and give us confidence that what we're measuring is actually real. So again, which one had the largest peak acceleration? 45 pounds, had the highest peak off the ground. It's kind of obvious when you think about it, right? If it's lighter, you should be able to move that thing faster. Um, we're not really hitting any of the limits yet on our power of our muscles, right? It's just Using Newton's second law, we can think about how much force you're, you're able to apply. Um, also, it had the highest acceleration when stopping the weight. Again, makes sense. 45 pound has a lot less mass and inertia that needs to slow down. So I'm able to basically stop that thing on a dime where even with 315, it's moving slowly, but it takes me a little longer to sort of slow it down once it gets going. All right, so let's take that, right? We can take that and we can go back to what are some of our notes from the free body diagram of a deadlift and not just look at the acceleration, right? But we can also look at force, right? Where force equals mass times acceleration. Maybe I should try and write that here, right? We know force equals, the, oh, that was rough, mass times acceleration, right? So we know what the mass is, right? I know what the mass is. The mass is, I'm gonna use the weight on, weight on the bar. And I know the acceleration on the bar because I measured that uh, experimentally, right? And then for force, well, I know there's a weight force going down. So how much force do I have to apply upward is the only unknown, right? Um, so if we look at each of these graphs, right? So I took the deadlift portion, the deadlift, just the pull portion filtered. Again, we haven't really looked at dropping the weight down. We're just looking at moving it from the ground up. I fixed the acceleration direction. So, you know, before it had negative was actually moving upward. So I flipped that whole graph so that way it made more sense to think about it in terms of applying more or less force, right? Um, and here on the graph, so on the Y axis, again, I have force in Newtons. On the X axis, I have our time in seconds. And then my top graph is 45. Our next graph is 135, 225, 315. So over here in the red dotted line, I didn't have this on the legend, but this is just how much force is applied with no acceleration. What's the static weight of the bar? So this one, this is 45 pounds, right? I can't exactly see what it is. Maybe it's 250 Newtons, right? And then 135 pounds might be like 750 Newtons. Again, so I have to change, I changed pounds to metric units because it's easier to think about and the accelerometer measures in meters per second. So um, hopefully you all know how to handle pounds and pounds force to kilograms, right? And multiplying it by 9.81 will give you the, the newtons or the weight of something. All right, so here, 
225 pounds is probably about a thousand newtons and then 315 pounds was maybe about 1400 newtons right so those are the red lines so you think if the thing isn't moving if i'm just holding the bar at the end right at my waist how much force am i applying onto our object well it should be just the weight right if i'm not accelerating it it should should be just holding up the static weight right this is our static part of the thing here so i plotted this so at the end of each of these i could do a sanity check and be like well at the end do I know I'm at the end of the rep? It should be when I'm just holding up the weight and not really accelerating. So you can see for each of these weights, we sort of end the rep, right? Where we're just holding that static amount of weight. So now if we're looking at 45 pounds, right? We have the acceleration that we measured before, which was really high, right? We had the highest acceleration. So I multiply that acceleration by the mass, again, subtracting out the weight, and I can tell you how much force we applied, right? And we have this sort of Again, I think this this first peak, right? What's going on with that first peak is probably the, just the hand motion. But the second peak here, we're applying about, I don't know, maybe 500 newtons of force, right? And it only weighs about 200 newtons, okay? So we're applying a lot more force than just the weight on the bar. Then I hit this inflection point here. So this is where our acceleration went negative, right? So this is like, getting the bar off the ground, starting to get it moving. And then this part here, I'm actually applying less force than just the weight of the bar, right? At that point, I don't need to apply as much force as the weight because it's already moving, right? Now I'm decelerating the weight. So the weight is almost, I don't wanna say weight less, right? But it is it does weigh less than it did if you think about how it's moving, right? So when it's decelerating, I don't have to apply as much force, then it stops and I need to just apply its weight. Right, I just need to have the force of the pole in my hands equal to the force of the weight. For 135 pounds, again, same thing. We have this little spike, which again, I think is probably probably artifact, but then it comes here and we get up, we get up to a thousand newtons, right? So even though 135 didn't have as much acceleration as 45, I had to apply more force to the bar, right? Because force equals mass times acceleration. So here we only got to like 750 newtons, for 135 pounds, I got up to about 1,000 newtons. And again, we hit this inflection point, right? I hit this inflection point here. This is when we start to decelerate. So now I'm applying less force to the bar as I'm slowing it down, and then it comes to rest. All right, with 225, again, artifact, let's say we'll start here. Now we're getting up to this range, right? Where this range is more looking at 1,500 newtons, right? hit the inflection point, we're starting to slow it down, come to rest. All right, for 315, again, we don't wanna look at this because that's the thing, just my hand moving. So now the, for the acceleration for 315, right? It was not very high. Like I said, it was not moving it very quickly. So what do you see about the force I'm applying compared to the weight? It's pretty close, right? I'm barely able to apply more force than just the weight on the bar. It's still maybe, 1500, 1600, 1700 newtons here, right? But it's over such a longer amount of time, it gets moving. And then here is the inflection point, And there I'm starting to slow it down. And then we just come back to just waiting. And so this one, it's hard to even tell if I'm actually accelerating it because it's kind of moving that slow. And you can see at the time point, right? So here's the inflection point for the, the 45er. So the inflection points change a little bit where the 45 pounder happened the fastest, 135, 225, or maybe about the same speed, maybe 225 is a little slower. But then the 315 was a, was a real grinder, right? Um, so from looking at the force applied, right, it looks like, where did I apply the most force? Well, maybe I hit the peak here, but really I was applying the most force during the 315 one for the long, a long amount of time here, right? I was applying 15 to 1700 newtons of force for a long amount of time where this one was just like oh, i'm at a thousand and then i sort of maybe peak at 1400 and then drop back down so if we're looking at force where did i apply the most force 315 probably had the largest force 225 was probably a close second right so so does this answer make sense well if we go back to our force velocity curve where are you able to provide the most force for a muscle right you're able to provide the most force sort of when you're isometric right here. Right? We're going to ignore the eccentric component right now because, again, we're doing a concentric lift. So if you can generally your muscles can apply individually, can apply the most force 
at slow speeds, right? When I was moving really fast, even though we had a lot of acceleration, like maybe this is 45 pounds, right? So we had a lot of acceleration out here. But again, I didn't, I wasn't able to provide as much force as I was with 315 at a slower speed. It's important to note, I was trying to apply as much force as I physically could for every single lift, right? Every one, I was trying my hardest, which is a little weird to think about, even with 45 pounds, right? But I tried to lift it as fast and as hard as I could, but it still was not as much as 315. And it comes down to the inherent nature of the force velocity curve of muscles, and that inside your muscles, you have those actinomyosin heads that are trying to grab, they can only grab so quickly. All right, now what about power, right? So power was force times velocity. So we need to calculate the velocity and we can do this by integrating the acceleration curve. So I can take that acceleration curve that we measured directly with the sensor on my wrist. I can integrate it and let's see what the velocity looks like. So I trimmed the acceleration here. I just want to show you, I trimmed them to remove those initial humps. You're saying I think that was our effect. So I got rid of those initial humps. This is again, the flipped version. So now this is the acceleration data that I directly used to find our velocity. And this is what I found. So this is our deadlift velocity. So it always starts at zero, right? We're starting with it on the ground. It starts at zero. At the end of the lift, well, it should also, it should intuitively come back to zero, right? But what do we see? That it doesn't actually come back to zero. It actually looks like it goes back somewhere negative. This is due to uh, sort of noise in the data, how you filter it, right? Um, some drift over time. So just to be clear, in real life, right? The deadlift starts at zero velocity. It ends at zero velocity at the top. Um, but this integration gives, it, it gets pretty close down here, right? But you can just see there's some noise happening. But if you look at 45 in blue, 135 in red, 225 in yellow, 315 in purple here, like 45 had the highest velocity, right? We went quickly, had a lot of velocity, but then it had to slow down and go back to zero. 135, again, a little less velocity, 225 less velocity. And then 315 is really where I took that big hit, right? Where I started to not be able to get anywhere close to the speeds that I was for, uh, you know, this is like almost a third of the speed of 225, uh, four times slower than 135 and five times slower than 45 pounds. So now that we have the velocity, right? I know velocity at every single time point and we know the force, right? I just calculated force last time. So I know the force at every single time point. So what I can do is I can take those two values, I can multiply them together. And what's that gonna get us? Anyone, anyone? That's our force, right? So I know the force, I have the velocity, multiply those two things together. What's gonna come? Power, right? Force times velocity, this is power. So here I have power in watts or newtons per meter second, newton meters per second over here samples on the x-axis. In blue, you can see the power for 45 pounds, red 135 pounds, yellow 225, 315 and purple. So what do you see? Where do we get the most power? We're not getting the most power at 45. Even though velocity is very high, force is low, right? So velocity is high, but force is low. So we're not getting a lot of power. 135, the power jumps up a lot. 225, we have this big spike in power, and then 315, not as much power as 225, right? Because at 315, the velocity was not very fast, even though I was applying the most force, right? So this sort of demonstrates exactly what we talked about in the, whatever, iPad lecture, right? Is we have this power curve. The purple, right, on the purple side, we were too close to the left-hand side of the curve. The blue, we were too close to the right. 135 and 225 were a lot closer to the middle part of that curve where we're, we're able, where our muscles are just inherently able to create the most power, right? So there you have it. We did some deadlifts, we collected some data, we applied some dynamics, we're doing all sorts of cool stuff and I'll post the, uh, the MATLAB code as a PDF too. So if you wanna look through some of that, I know most of you probably haven't had a ton of MATLAB experience, but I'm a big fan, right? MATLAB is, is your friend. It, it makes things way easier to do things like this. And honestly, there's no way to do these calculations otherwise. Like imagine trying to calculate power. This is like hundreds of times a second, right? Like this is like thousands of calculations. There's no way to do that by hand, right? But you can just write up some code in MATLAB. You hit play 
it'll do millions and millions of calculations for you, right? So you can you can apply some really cool stuff there. Um, so if you haven't used MATLAB, don't be afraid of it. Once you get over the initial hump, it's great. It gives you a lot of a, a lot of power, <laughs> pun intended. All right. So again, here we go. We have this force velocity curve that translates to our power curve here, where power is force times velocity or torque times angular velocity. Like I said, velocity, this was probably like the 315. Maybe this was like 225. Maybe this was 135. Man, this is terrible with a mouse. And maybe like this was 45. And yeah, I also don't like using pounds in general. I feel like pounds are terrible. Try to use kilograms and standard units if you can. But since everybody deadlifts using pounds, I figured we'd talk in the same, the same language. All right, so, so that's sort of it. That's the wrap up. So I want to thank you for taking some time to listen through all this stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at gregory.freisinger at westpoint.edu. Also, for any plebes and yearlings, I forgot to ask Major Feltner before if he had any plebes or yearlings in this class, but we do offer an introduction to biomechanical engineering every two years. So I'm teaching that class right now, um, but if you're still around in 22-2, you are more than welcome to sign up. The only prereq is physics, right? So you, you would learn some MATLAB, you would learn some some dynamics, but it's not just for mechanical engineers. We want to make it inclusive. So if, if this sort of thing interests you, please let me know. Talk to your DAX. We can get you signed up if you have some time. But I hope this was fun. If, and if not fun, maybe useful. And you can think about it a little bit next time you're banging weights in the gym. But uh, yeah, thanks for your time. I'll uh, talk to you again soon.